somehow Tomlinson is a is a Texan related name. Um, what, what what did your grandfather's grand grand grandparents do? Here? And um, well, hang on before we start. Yeah. So. When you say that, you mean like my ancestors? Yeah, your ancestors. So we're going back to yesterday's? So. Yeah, just for a while. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Um, we came in, we killed Indians. No, I'm kidding. No, we didn't. Well, okay, a little bit. Anyway, um, no, what What are my grandparents? My, what are my ancestors? Yeah. ancestors? What are your ancestors, yeah. Well, my ancestors came to Texas uh, in the early 1800s with a gentleman named Moses Austin, which is a great name for somebody who's going to lead you into a new land. Um, and they became a part of what we call in Texas the first 300, uh, which are the first 300 settlers. They came in under the Spanish Empire. They pledged loyalty to the king. They became Catholics uh, and uh, uh, began to settle in Texas. And uh, then over time, uh, became a part of uh, the founding activities that actually started what was at the time the nation of Texas. Um, we're very proud of the fact in Texas that we were actually a country for uh, like nine years. Um, it kind of uh, helps define our attitude a little bit, which is different than you'll see in most uh, people in the US. You know, it's funny, whenever I'm overseas uh, in customs, uh, things like that, they ask you, uh, uh, where are you from? And I'll say, Texas instead of U.S. Um, so we, you know, we, our family is very much of a pioneering spirit. We're not a wealthy family, but we're very proud of our heritage. And uh, the nice thing about heritage is you don't have to be wealthy to have one that you can be proud of. So yeah, we uh, helped start Texas and uh, very, very, means a lot to us. It means a lot to us. The lady showed you some documents. Did you ever see, saw that before? Some of the documents she showed us yesterday, I had never seen before. Um, some of the letters from my ancestors back and forth in the, in the colony at the time um, were very interesting to me. And uh, um, we're, we're constantly finding new things out about uh, our ancestors. I, a couple of years ago, found that there was a book written called The, uh, the Fighting Tumlinsons, A Texas Ranger Legacy. Um, it's out of print now. But it does turn out that we have 38 uh, Texas Rangers in my family, that we helped start the Texas Rangers. Um, so yeah, it, it, heritage is, is very important to us. Um, I don't live out of it every day. It's not something I walk around going, hey, you know. But it, is, uh, it helps with the foundation of who you are. It helps you um, be able to relate. And especially in my case, the fact that my ancestors uh, helped open this frontier put me in a position psychologically from a very young age to be focused on the next. Yeah, it, it focuses on being a settler. Somewhere. You know, my, yeah, my, my ancestors were settlers. They left a place that they didn't want to be in and went to a new place that they knew very little about. They brought their tools they brought their attitude, they came as part of a community, and settled it, turned it into a, a place which they could call home. And did it form you in your current uh, idea of settling into Spain? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it had a, a great deal. Um, as a child, uh, let me start again. Do you mind? Yeah. I'm sorry. How, how did this idea of being a settler form you as a kid or your ideas at this moment? You know, when I was a child, I was um, exposed to a lot of, of different inputs. Um, I remember uh, I was an asthmatic, and so I spent a lot of time reading, um, and uh, I read science fiction. At the same time, I spent a lot of time out in West Texas with my grandparents, um, and they would let me roam, and I would go out into the, out into the desert and uh, uh, explore. Um, and yet, at the same time as all of that was going on, I also had my English background because I spent several years in England, um, and there was this feeling of the 
uh, the Age of Exploration that I picked up there. Um, and it all kind of blended together. And underlying everything was this thing about being a Texan, being from a family of settlers. Um, and I think, you know, when you're a child, these things kind of can blur together into helping you create an identity for yourself. So for me, uh, it really became sort of projected on the future what my family had taught me about our past. Why were you dreaming of space? One of the reasons, to be frank about it, is probably I didn't like where I was. In other words, we escape to places that make us feel uh, good, better, stronger, more excited. Um, that's why we have fantasy. That's why we have science fiction. That's why we have movies. Um, um, and so for me, um, dealing with what I was dealing with as a child, uh, I had uh, a, a way to escape. I could read science fiction stories and these heroes on these rocket ships and going off to new worlds in space. And they were doing all kinds of incredible things. And I could, uh, as any child would reading those books, visualize myself as those heroes doing those things. Um, and I really think that's, that's, why, that's why we have fiction. But in my particular case, rather than um, you know, being a, reading detective novels or something else, I went into the future and, and inhabited that. And it, in a sense, inhabited me. Somehow you are going to live your dream. When I was growing up, one of the funny things, sorry, when I was growing up, um, what was happening was that we had the Apollo program. And so you would turn on the evening news and you would see several things happening. You would see Vietnam and the Cold War, this imminent threat hanging over our heads that we were going to die in a nuclear attack at any time between the U.S. and the Soviets. And then you'd flip the channel and we'd be doing these incredible things in space. There's Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Soyuz, all of these cool things. So it was like bad news, bad news, bad news. Look, we're doing something in space. And then you turn the next channel and there's Captain Kirk, you know, going into the you know, places no one has gone before. As a child, I think that those positive ideas of what the future could be like being reinforced as they were at that moment in my life by what was really happening, I put them together and I said, of course, I want to take what's happening now and I want to go do that. And then you roll in underneath it, the idea of my family being settlers and part of the frontier, and you've got this, who I am now and what I do. So what was the first moment you realized that you, well, were going this road? The road of... Yeah, the road of... Actually wanted, working wanted on it? To, yeah, working, working on, on it. it. Mm -hmm. there, was, there were several steps in my life, um, at, at which point each one moved me further. Um, I remember sitting in college um, on the floor of my student union um, and watching uh, this... Uh, icon of the 1970s and 60s, Timothy Leary, giving a speech about colonies in space that this guy named Gerard K. O'Neill had come up with. And I was just inspired. It all came home to me that I want to help make that happen. I didn't know how, um, because I was such a rebellious student. I had walked out of my classes. I always thought as many of us do, that I was smarter than my teachers. And uh, so I would have fights with my professors and my teachers, and I would storm out of the class and drop the classes. Um, but I stayed in school, uh, mainly because it gave me community, and I guess that's where the girls were. But it kept me going. And, and so I see, I sit in the student union of my, uh, my school, and there is Timothy Leary showing colonies in space, Gerard K. O'Neill's ideas. And I decided that I want to make that happen, but I didn't know how. 
So then a few months later, and these are amazing coincidences, I guess, because the one thing I had been doing was doing a, a tech support for theater, I find myself backstage with uh, a guy named Gene Roddenberry. And he had just created a television series. Um, or he, Sorry, should I start again? No, yeah, sorry. yeah, so maybe you start yeah. again. Yeah, uh, I scratch my head. The, the whole story? Tell me, yeah. tell me, Larry? Okay, here we go. So when they... Uh, so, so when I was in college, I find myself sitting on the floor of the student union, and there's a guy speaking named Timothy Leary. He's talking about colonies in space where people would live that were created, the, an idea that was created by a guy named Gerard K. O'Neill. And I wanted to make that happen. But I didn't know how because I had been such a rebel in my, my school, yelling at my teachers, walking out of classes. I never was finishing all my classes. Um, but I did find myself at one point working in my school's theater department doing tech. And so there I was at this uh, uh, lecture, and there was a guy there named Gene Roddenberry who had created Star Trek. And for a few minutes, I was backstage with him alone. And um, I, I had to ask, I said, I, you know, I love Star Trek. I want to make that happen. How do I do that? How do I do it? Because I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a terrible student. And Mr. Roddenberry uh, s said, just stick to your guns. Stay with your dream. Don't ever give up. And I said, well, that, that's great. But how do I take my skills and, and help us create the world of Star Trek? How do I help us move into space? And he stopped and he said, do you know what I was before the television series? And I didn't know. He said, I was an L.A. cop. I used to drive around in a police car. And it kind of blew my mind. What it, what it told me, because in my mind, as many kids probably have today in their mind, you have to be an engineer or a scientist or have some specialty that's directly related to building rockets and things like that to be able to participate in the opening of the frontier. When he told me that, I realized I didn't have to. I realized that I could just take whatever it was, mainly my passion, and apply it to the cause. And as long as I stayed in there, and I, and I studied a lot on my own um, and worked hard, I would eventually be able to make a contribution. And uh, he apparently was somewhat right. You also studied with uh, Gerard O'Neill. Somehow even his books have become your Bible, haven't they? Jerry O'Neill is... I'm sorry, I'm starting out. Or scratch. <laughs> Sorry. So what about Gerard O'Neill? Jerry O'Neill is far too often overlooked in what is happening in space right now. Everybody thinks it's uh, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or uh, um, Richard Branson or the X Prize or this or that or the other that made all of this happen or, um, you know, or, or let's say it's the old space program and those guys. The guy who is really responsible for making a lot of what is happening today uh, occur is Gerard K. O'Neill. He wrote a book called The High Frontier in the 1970s. And you have to think about that period for a moment. We had been to the moon. We had Galileo and Voyager going out into the uh, solar system. We could do anything. And, you know, we had Star Trek on our TVs. Uh, all of these kind of inputs into this generation that had just come, was in the middle of the Cold War. We had just come through Vietnam. We needed something to excite us. And... Ahead of us, in the early 80s, was this idea of a thing called the space shuttle. And we were told it was going to fly 50 times a year. It was only going to be $100 a pound to go into space. We could do anything. And Dr. O'Neill wrote a book called The High Frontier. And in this book, he basically said, you don't have to be an astronaut. You don't have to be a part of a government program to participate in the opening of space. Take your ideas. Take your passion, take your tools, and utilize the resources of space. You could build settlements, colonies, 
you could build families out there in the frontier. And the book, which was called The High Frontier, inspired a lot of us. So on top of that, what he did was he formed an organization and then he started having a conference in Princeton, uh, which he called the Space Manufacturing Conference. And we used to call it the Not Ready for Prime Time Conference. And we would go uh, out to this conference and say things that you couldn't say at a normal space conference at the time. For example, maybe somebody will buy a ticket to go into space. Maybe there's things in the asteroids that we can use to build uh, civilization. Uh, maybe there's ice on the moon. Maybe I, as an individual, could start a space company and do something important. And people would take you seriously. He and his partner, Freeman Dyson and Dr. John Lewis, would be sitting at the front of the room going, hmm, that's an interesting idea. And us, the young, crazy Turks at the time, would sit there and say all of these things and interact with each other and started creating a community. Now, out of that community came most of the different space organizations we have here in the United States. Um, the National Space Society, my organization, the Space Frontier Foundation, the International Space University, um, the X Prize, uh, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, eventually the Mars Society. All of these organizations go back to Dr. O'Neill. Can you show me the uh, Bible? The Bible. <laughs> So this is the, one of the original copies of uh, The High Frontier that Dr. O'Neill wrote. Um, and here's what's really interesting about it. If you think of this versus maybe what you saw back then from NASA and the space agencies, it's green. That's a neighborhood in there. This is a rotating facility that provides gravity. But whether it's in space, on the moon, or on Mars, really doesn't matter at the core. It's green. There are communities, houses, there are people living in here, working together just as we do outside in the uh, town where we live. So when he did this book, he was able to tap into something that we hadn't seen before, right? Even, even if you go back to the core of science fiction, people like Buck Rogers and these, these guys are all rock star heroes, you know, superheroes, the gladiators of space, things like that. Dr. O'Neill said, that's wonderful, but let's just go build a home. And it touched us. Um, it put inside of us this idea that um, we're just extending who we are out there, that we have the right stuff, all of us. It's interesting, he really cares about humans in space. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, there was, this might get me in trouble, but there was um, the old space program, the, the one that, the Cold War space program. It's what I call the Von Braunian space program. Uh, was this idea of, you know, we were going to space and you would sit in your couch and you would watch the expensive space program as we take your tax dollars and we'd go into space. And that was sort of a command economy, uh, a national controlled space program. The Soviets had one, we had one. Um, the other way of looking at space is what I call the Saganites. So you have the Von Braunians and you have the Saganites. And the Saganites are, you know, billions and billions of stars. Look at this incredible universe. Isn't it grand? Isn't it great? Look at God's handiwork spread out in the sky. Look at it, but don't touch it. All right? Now that's astronomy, things like that. And, and I love that. But it was very much hands-off. Most people don't realize at the beginning, back when Dr. O'Neill was starting, uh, Carl Sagan didn't believe that civilians could, should go into space. He was against it. He actually disliked Dr. O'Neill. He called Dr. O'Neill a robber baron who wanted to plunder and pillage God's pristine solar system. Um, and then there's Dr. O'Neill, who was the third category. Now, he didn't have a funny voice. He didn't have a funny accent. He did have a beetle haircut, which he always had until the end of his life, but he was a very, very gentle man. And he basically said, take your dreams, your imaginations, and your tools, and use the resources of space to expand civilization. Open the high frontier. Why was it so appealing to you? 
because I wasn't, it was, Dr. O'Neill's message was appealing to me because I wasn't an astronaut, because I was just a guy. I was just a kid from Texas who had grown up in England and, you know, I, I was just a kid. I'll start that again if you want. Um, Dr. O'Neill's message was so appealing to me because I wasn't an astronaut. I was just a kid. I was just a guy. You know, I was just a normal human being who had a set of skills that maybe hadn't been honed by being a physicist or an astronomer or a, an engineer. And yet what he was saying was that I could participate, that I, just like the astronauts, just like the engineers, just like the astronomers and the physicists, I had the right stuff. And that gave me an opening. And, you know, if you believe that you can make a contribution to something, if you believe that you can add value to something, um, that you can take whatever skill set you have and you can participate in something, and that thing is grand and exciting and inspiring, you should always step forward and do it. And they called me forth. The other important point was the kindness of the people involved. They let me participate. Here was this crazy guy who, uh, you know, obviously talks too much, <laughs> is very excited about it. And I showed up and I volunteered and uh, I offered to, you know, I'll sweep the floor, whatever you want. Just let me in. Just let me, let me do this. Um, I started in uh, New York City. Um, let me back up here. Um, let's start again. Okay. So one of the other moments that occurred uh, was I, I took a course about becoming myself. Um, I took a course. It was, I took a course called Est at the time, and it was a bit controversial, but it kind of broke open my psychology a little bit. Um, so I took this this course, and it helped me realize that I had more potential than I thought I did. Um, three months after the course, I ended up, uh, even though I thought it hadn't helped me at all, I ended up uh, married, living in Manhattan and making the decision that I was gonna change my life. Um, I remember one evening sitting on one of the piers on the Hudson River. Uh, I had just gotten to New York City and looking up at the sky and just thinking, I wanna do something important. Now, at the time, my skill set wasn't physics or science and I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do. I, I literally thought at one point I would make great movies that would get people excited about space. Um, I was just feeling around, trying to find a way to, to help the cause. But I knew I wanted to do this. So one of the things I did was uh, I started uh, the New York L5 Society. Um, L5 being a place in space where you would build a colony. Uh, and we went to the people uh, at the Intrepid Aircraft Carrier Museum and we asked him if we could start having a monthly meeting. So I started putting on these monthly meetings at the Intrepid Aircraft Carrier all about space. And we would invite important people to come and give lectures. And I would go to dinner with those people before and I would hang out with them afterwards. And they would get to know me and I would get to know them and I would have their contact information. And, um, and I would learn from them. And at the same time, I was building an organization. And we started to grow, and we started to really look at uh, how we could influence the political system and how we could influence people to make this happen. At one point um, in the late 80s, uh, while I was working for Dr. O'Neill's Institute, which was the Space Studies Institute, um, my associates and I decided that we needed to be a little more radical. We needed to do more than just do research. We needed to do more than just have great meetings. Um, the space program was off track. It wasn't going the way we had thought. Keep in mind, before the space shuttle flew, we were promised it was gonna fly 50 times a year. When it started to fly, the maximum I think it ever flew was around five times in one year. And rather than it being only $100 to get into space, it was $10,000.
There was no way we were going to be able to open the frontier with those kind of costs. I remember sitting at one point um, in a bar in Princeton. Sorry. I remember sitting at one in one. I remember sitting at one point in a bar in Princeton with my friends at one of Dr. O'Neill's conferences. And we were a merry band having a good time. And we started talking about how we were going to make this happen. And I remember us, uh, my friends who founded the International Space University and myself and some of the others who went off and did political things, pledging ourselves, pledging our lives and fortunes to helping humanity break out of the planet Earth in our lifetimes. And we toasted. One of the guys called it uh, a benign conspiracy. And I said, that sounds like a cancerous tumor. Maybe we should call it a benevolent conspiracy. We said, okay, benevolent conspiracy. To this day, almost every person that was sitting at that table has stayed in the revolution, as we call it, and is making it happen. It ranges from the X Prize to people building spacecraft to people that actually changed the laws so that uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos could fly. They're still in the fight. So you became a um, space advocate, or maybe in Texan terms, space cowboy. <laughs> I didn't enter this field with the idea that I was going to have to help create, in a way, a revolution. It wasn't my plan. I remember uh, at one point testifying in front of a, a, a commission that the way we were going to open space was that NASA needed more support and we needed to have more astronauts on talk shows. And that would change everything. Um, sorry about that. I'm going to do that again. Can I do it again? Yeah. No. So, so you became a space advocate or maybe in Texan terms, a space cowboy? You could call it a cowboy. Um, I've been called I've been called a cowboy, a gunslinger, um, and a few worse things by people that I've had to take on to make what is happening now happen. Um, <laughs> my joke was that since I don't get paid, I may as well have a, a great image to deal with. You know, so space cowboy. I've been called a pirate. I mean, it, there's there's a lot of different words that people apply to us. Um, in the end, uh, the word I'd like to have applied is um, effective. We made the change happen. Um, you know, in 1995, I was uh, I got to sit in front of Congress, and uh, do you want to cut and we'll go with your questions because I'm yeah, I'll yeah, just yeah, go, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, I try and pause and <laughs> yeah, give you breaks, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you you you're okay. in charge. Okay, um, let me cover. So you. Uh, you were talking about that you had this organization and all those people are still in the organization. But what do you want to make? Why do you want to make colonies in space? I mean, we have a lot of space here on Earth. You could say Earth pretty wealthy. Why do you, would we want to go out to outer space? There are several reasons that I've dedicated my life to making this happen. It is my personal existential belief it is the reason I believe I am here to help life and humanity expand into the universe now why is that important well my first answer would be why isn't that important but I believe that human beings no let me change that I declare, in other words, whether this is a belief, whether I'm right, whether I'm wrong, doesn't really matter. Oh, sorry. sorry. Let's, let's start. <laughs> yeah, let's start that okay. again. So, so why, why is why, it? Why? 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 You know, why we go into space is, is a question we get a lot. And I believe it is our job. I believe it is our job on several levels. I believe that when it relates to the universe, we are the way the universe knows of itself. We are the sensing mechanism by which the universe has consciousness. 
we create the universe just as the universe created us so it could be created by us. We are the means by which an entity that we call the universe, which doesn't even exist until we call it into existence by naming it the universe and giving it certain characteristics. We are the entity by, by which, or we the mechanism by which that entity knows of itself. That's number one. Number two, we, we are alive. Without living things, in my belief, the universe would expand and devolve into maybe equally charged particles an equal distance apart forever and ever anon and nothing, entropy as they call it, into nothingness. We go into space because we represent life. And I believe that it is the duty of life to move into places where there is no life. And we human beings are the seed carriers. We are the beings on this planet that have the capability to carry life itself into space. The beauty of what we are engaged in right now, as far as expanding into space, is that after the entire history of humanity being one in which human civilization seems to have attacked what we call the ecosystem, as we developed our technology and our civilization, is that we're reversing that process. And for the first time in human civilization, rather than the expansion of our technology, meaning an attack on, let's call it the ecosystem, the expansion of our technology beyond the earth means we can expand the ecosystem because we're gonna carry life with us. That's, that's your vision, that we're going to carry life into the universe? You know, I have uh, this organization called New Worlds, and our logo is a green hand with a galaxy. That's on purpose, because we believe that our job as human beings is to carry life where there is no life. Our slogan is to carry the light of life to places now dark, the seeds of life to places now dead, and the eyes, hands, and imaginations of humanity to places unseen, untouched, and unexplored. That's what I'm about. That's my life mission, in a sense, in, in one paragraph. But the other mission is also in sort of exploit, um, let's say, the, com the, the, the asteroids, the, the matter in outer space. It's very easy to have abstract conversations about, wow, let's go into space and let's do all these amazing things. But at the end of the day, somebody has to pay for it. At the end of the day, it has to be able to pay for itself. So yeah, I could have amazing dreams of what the future is going to look like or what it should look like. Sorry. I could have amazing dreams of what our future in space could or should look like. But my attitude is I have to make it happen. And the way I have to make it happen is I have to make it pay for itself. And the way to make it pay for itself is to create a business, to create uh, an economic infrastructure in which wealth is generated by what we're doing in space. Could you say that there is a sort of shift in looking towards space at this moment? I mean, we have been doing that for since the 50s from the last century, but somehow it feels as if there's a change. Could you sort of describe what this change is? What's happening now, is, sorry, what's happening now is the transition from space being dominated by governments and being approached as a place where they carry out their programs to space being seen as a place where people who were inspired by those programs are able to go out and make things happen. In other words, the children of Apollo, the children who were inspired by Apollo and Soyuz and the Cold War space program have now grown up with those dreams inside of them and they're going out to open the frontier. And these children of Apollo are very pragmatic. 
they're business oriented, they're creative, and they're using the incredible technologies we have today to go out and make it happen. You have a slogan, your company has a slogan, which is uh, unlimited future for mankind. What, what does it mean? I mean, why this slogan? Um, my, my company, Deep Space Industries, I'm going to come at this from one angle and then another. Is yeah. that right? Okay. My company, uh, I, I founded Deep Space Industries uh, because, in a sense, out of my, my Texas heritage, you have to be able to walk the walk if you're going to talk the talk. I've been talking the talk for a long time. And in, the case, in this case, walking the walk means going out and making it actually happen. Deep Space Industries is focused on harvesting the resources of space. Because if we can use the resources of space, we have an unlimited future out there. Think of it this way. If I have to carry everything with me from the Earth into space that I need to do anything, I will always be limited by the cost of carrying those things from the Earth's surface. If, on the other hand, I can utilize what I find in space, the metals, the water, the materials, the energy that's in space itself coming from the sun. And if I can use those things to do what I'm going to do in space, whether I'm going to live there, whether I'm going to create an industry there, whatever it is, a new economy, um, then I'm unlimited. Then I'm released. The earth, sorry, I'm sorry. When we're on the earth, we sit at the bottom of a gravity well. And that gravity well is the reason that we have to build such large rockets. If you'll notice when you look at a rocket, there's this gigantic engine or set of engines, and then there's this little tiny thing at the top, which is the payload or the astronauts. That's because it takes so much energy to lift ourselves off the planet into space. Why not be out in space and utilize what we have out there rather than having to take all of that energy to lift ourselves out of the gravity well. Sorry. Yep, go ahead. And then you create machines that actually mine, dig into asteroids, those kinds of things? I'm sorry, do you want to ask me again? I, I'm yeah. gonna, okay. So then you create machines or ideas uh, about machines that are able to dig into asteroids. Yes. Um, the resources of space are basically limitless. So if we can get out there and, and mine asteroids, harvest space resources, maybe is a better way to put it, um, then we are unbounded from the Earth. Then all we need to do is send people and some small machines and we can start expanding in space. You know, um, it's interesting with... I'm sorry. It's interesting with deep space because our goal is eventually to support the expansion of humanity into space. But to be pragmatic about it, um, the first thing we're going to send out there is robots. Very, very small robots in many cases that will be able to tell us what resources we're finding on asteroids and eventually robots that will help, uh, that will go out and begin mining the resources from those asteroids. Um, that allows us to keep costs very low as far as um, how we're extracting those resources and allows us to begin building our industrial base out there. So then you know what's there and then? Yeah, uh, so, so I'm gonna slip into deep space mode, DSI mm -hmm. mode for a yeah. minute here. That's gonna go corporate on yeah. you. Yeah. So the goal of deep, deep space industries is to harvest, sorry, the goal of deep space industries is to prospect for, find, harvest, process, and utilize space resources. Our first missions are going to be, within the next year or so, to test our spacecraft in Earth orbit. We're working with the government of Luxembourg to build what we call Prospector X, which will show us the different technologies, demonstrate the technologies that we plan to utilize to go out to the asteroids. Prospector X actually has a motor that is a steam engine, a very ancient technology. 
we're heating up water and the steam goes this way and the rocket goes that way. It's a very, what I would call frontier technology because it's so basic. And since the main material that we're looking to harvest from the asteroids in their first phase is water, it makes perfect sense that we're creating the technology that will utilize that water to allow us to get around. In other words, we're creating the market by having people use a motor that has water as its, its main power supply that will then be fed into by what it is we harvest, which is ice. I'm going to comment this from a couple of ways. It's, it's interesting. It somehow relates to the story of this, the early settlers using the stuff that's there. One of the key things about being able to open a frontier is being able to live off the land. You simply can't go into a frontier and settle a frontier if everything you need there has to come from where you came from. So that's actually why you need to go there and mine it and then use it. Right. The goal of Deep Space is to help accelerate the opening of the frontier by providing resources in space so that we can dramatically decrease the cost of doing things out there. Could you describe somehow, suppose we are living, let's say 20, maybe 30 years from now, what do you expect it to be? I would say within the next 20 years, there are going to be people living in space. In other words, the place they are in space is what they're going to consider their home settlers. I believe we're going to have industries starting to develop in space that might include space solar power systems. Um, but certainly, I, I believe strongly that there are going to be people living on Mars and I believe that our organization, our company, Deep Space, is going to be operating out there and building large infrastructure uh, items such as uh, space systems that can be used um, to... Blah, blah, blah. I went off the deep end there. Sorry. <laughs> well, let, let, let's stop. I again. tangled myself yeah, up. But to try to sort of imagine 30 years from now. So what would I see? What would I, would I do? I'm just an ordinary guy as well. Mm -hmm. So... Within 30 years, probably for about the cost of your house, you'll be able to go live on Mars or the moon and probably in a colony that somebody's building in what I call free space. In other words, the place between the moon, Earth and Mars. Um, new civilization is going to be starting. Now, any other time, that would be crazy talk. But when you look at what's happening now with companies like mine, where we're going to go mine and harvest resources from asteroids. When you have an Elon Musk, when you have a Jeff Bezos, when you have a Richard Branson, you have these other people coming online. Um, when you have the advance in technology that's happening as quickly as it is right now, um, this is really going to happen. And it's going to happen in probably, yeah, in the next 15 to 20 or 30 years. Absolutely. But why now? <laughs> We are at a moment in time where we have an intersection in the technologies and the capability and the imagination to be able to break out into space. We have technologies that were developed in the Cold War. The, it, here's, here's an incredible thing to me. The very same technologies that we developed in the Cold War, ICBM rockets, computers, to calculate how you could kill the most people or guide the rockets to their locations, um, the means of communications, all of these things that we created to attack each other on this planet are the very same technologies that have come together now to allow us to leave this planet and expand into the universe. And you think it is, let's say, um, well, humanity into space. It's our goal. It's our destiny. I think it is the destiny of the human race to expand our civilization and life itself into the universe. It's why we are here. It is why I am here. This is my job and the job of my associates and my friends who are building rockets and space companies and things like that to make it happen. 
you probably must have heard the argument, okay, we're making a mess here, so then we go out into space, make a mess there. Why do we go into space if we have so many problems here on the Earth? Exactly. Every time we move into a new frontier, every time we push beyond the place we are, we discover more things about that place and ourselves that we can apply to the civilization, to the place we come from, and make it better. Every time that humanity has moved into a new place, whether it means going up the coast of Africa as primal um, ape-like creatures and beginning to become uh, human beings and create civilizations, whether it means the Greeks moving this way or that way, whether it's China coming out of its boundaries or the, uh, the early settlers coming across the ocean or the people before them that came across the Bering Straits and began to settle in North and South America. Every time we move into new places, we get better. We become better at being human beings. And I think especially, I think especially in the, the current era where we have the ability to look back at the mistakes we've made you know, the awareness of history that we have now is probably is absolutely greater than we've ever had in, in the history of humanity. I'm sorry. The awareness of history that we have at this moment in time is the very thing that will allow us to move into the future in a way where we can minimize the mistakes of the past. It's a very exciting time. It's a very wonderful time to be alive if you think about it. Now, look. If you look at the media and you believe the stories we feed ourselves, then things are terrible. You know, the planet's falling apart, we're blah, all these different things. Yes, we have to take care of planet Earth. This is all about life. This is all about planet Earth. I am a tree hugger. Okay, I'm a Texas tree hugger, so I'm a tree hugger with a gun. But I am a tree hugger. I'm an environmentalist. I love planet Earth. I love life. I love things that grow. I want to see that expand. I want to see us create new possibilities. We can only do that if we begin to look at new places, if we begin to go into new places. You know, the environmental movement on the Earth may not have been started by it, but it was certainly given a boost by the first time they looked back at the Earth from space because it gives us a context, because it gives us an understanding that we live on this tiny little blue marble floating in this incredible void, just this place we call the universe. We look at this little tiny blue marble and we go, oh my gosh, you know, we, we're, we're precious. Life is precious. So yeah, we have problems here on earth. And guess what? We're going to have problems when we go into space. We're not gonna get, um, we're not suddenly going to become perfect by moving into space. There's not going to be some incredible utopia. But where do we go on the earth to try the next thing? Where do you go on the earth right now to create a, a new civilization? Where do you go on earth to try the next thing that follows democracy? That isn't owned by somebody else? Where do we go to try new ways of interacting with our fellow human beings? Where do we go to explore new ideas? You know, you need an edge. Without an edge, the center comes apart. We have to have an edge. We have to have a place where people who are maybe a little different can do new things. It's almost as if space will be the next laboratory for human civilization. We'll get to go into space and we'll get to try different ways of creating an economy, different ways of acquiring knowledge, different ways of acting with each other. I, I'm excited by it. I, I think it's incredible. And you know what? I'm not going to like everything they do out there. And that's just fine. Because as we go out there, we're going to learn so much more about ourselves. So I say, let's go. Settlers have the, that's actually what you're calling, becoming other species, um, distributing ourselves over the universe. You know, the, I, I, I um, hang on. I, I sometimes have trouble with the word destiny because it sounds like oh, it's just going to happen no matter what you do. Um, this is an active process. What we're doing in trying to break the human species out beyond the earth is an act of creation. We have to make it happen. There's no guarantee it's going to happen. And, and so when I hear the word, it's our destiny to go into space, 
I don't know. It, it's something we need to do, something we have to do, something we should do, but it isn't preordained that it's going to happen. I don't want us to ever get lazy about this. You know, we, we could end up in a civilization that doesn't go out into space and then we die. You know, we kill ourselves. Um, uh, an asteroid hits the planet and destroys us. Um, there's so many different things that could go wrong. The sun sends out a flare one, one day and just wipes us out with a little lick of flame. I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, we have an ant's understanding of the universe around us. You know, <laughs> how does an ant understand the bottom of the shoe that steps on it? It has no comprehension of a foot and a shoe that crushes it. We have no comprehension of what could be out there in the solar system, in the galaxy, or in the universe that could wipe us out like that. Now, some might say, well, then why bother to do anything? My attitude is, no, human beings are pretty cool. Life is great. Living systems, this amazing planet we're on, is pretty cool. Um, I want to see it live. I want to see it expand. You could also say, or people could also say, well, dream on. It's a nice dream. <laughs> this is all about dreams. And it's all, oh, sorry. This is all about dreams. And it's about making dreams happen. You know, I could sit on the couch and run my television and I could just get lost in dreams or I could do my video game and just get lost in dreams. That may be fine for some people. It's not good enough for me. I have to create something. I have to make something happen. I have to help create the future. I believe that's why we're here. You know, if, if I make no contribution to making something happen, to moving myself, my life, and my society's uh, life forward, I may as well be a rock. I may as well be a bush. You know, I, I believe it's why we're here. We're not, human beings are, uh, by our very nature, not passive. We don't just exist to exist. That's wonderful. It's very Zen-like, and, and believe me, I, I uh, have a deep understanding, and I'm always a student of things like Zen and Tao and the way of just going with the flow. But I'm also a human being, and I have a dream, and I'm dedicating my life to make it happen. And you have settler's DNA. <laughs> I'm, I'm, look... Uh, we all have the DNA of, of explorers and settlers. It's whether we choose to act on it or not that counts. That's the difference. It's the simple act in a moment, a decision that occurs in just a moment of taking an action. That moment. We do it every day. We either do something that moves us forward, we do something that changes our future, or we don't. And we make those decisions moment by moment every day. I have chosen to try and create a better future. I have chosen and taken the stand that I believe it is my job to create that destiny, to make that future happen in which we have expanded beyond the earth. That's what I do. That's what my friends who are building these rockets, building these companies, making these things happen, they believe it too. They're here to do that too. Now, we could take a different approach and I could take a different approach in life and, and just watch science fiction and play video games. I've chosen to take those things that I see and make them happen. That's nice. Um, Ask me again. Okay, so, so how would those colonies in space look? What, how, what are they? You know, a basic space colony, uh, whether it's the moon, Mars, or free space, has some things. You have to be able to have air, water, food. They're the basic principles that we deal with here. You know, you have to have protection in space, however, from radiation. Radiation in space is, is very dangerous. Cosmic rays 
are one of our biggest problems. And you see, um, when we're here on the earth, we're protected by a magnetic field. And it's a very interesting thing because once you go outside of that field, cosmic rays, they disrupt your DNA. So when you're in space, you're going to have to have a large shield around you. You know, we have these pictures often of, um, of bubbles of glass on Mars and the moon. That's really not how it's going to be at first. You're going to be under several feet of lunar or Martian soil to protect you from radiation or water, ice. You need to be, um, you need to make up for the fact that you don't have the radiation belts, what we call the Van Allen belts. I'm going to start again on that. Okay. When you're in space. In, maybe I make it a little yeah, bit yeah. short. Yeah. So, so what would a space colony look like? Space colonies are basically going to be bubbles of life. And they're going to have to be protected from radiation. Because once you get beyond the Van Allen belts that protect us here on the Earth, you're going to have to have something, we call it shielding, several feet thick. Um, and basically, it's a closed system. You have to generate your own food, air, water. That's the same whether you're on the moon, Mars, or in space itself. Um, now, when you're in space, you can build colonies that rotate, and that provides you art what we call artificial gravity. Um, and you can rotate them the same speed or at a speed which duplicates the gravity of the Earth. When you're on Mars, you're stuck with Martian gravity. When you're on the moon, you're stuck with lunar gravity. So those people that live there at some point will get to a point a few generations in where they probably won't be able to come back to the Earth. Um, space colonies, no matter where they are, the moon, Mars, or in free space itself, have certain basic similarities. They have to protect you from radiation. They have to provide you with an atmosphere. You have to be able to have food. Um, and you have to be able to have a way to get around. That's basically it. But you also need family life, for example. Because one of the things of, of uh, O'Neill is actually, he sort of shows it as a family life. Once we get past the very first basic stages of exploration, which is kind of where we are, where you have astronauts going out and coming back, we move into the settlement phase, which is where people go to live out their lives um, in this new place and carve out a future for their, the next generations. You're going to see families growing in space. And it's going to be very much like uh, the old settlers moving out into the frontier here on Earth. Um, children who are going to grow up in space and think of space as their home. You're going to have entire generations growing up in space who think of space as their home. They're going to have all the skills. They're going to know almost at a very intuitive level that if this thing breaks, how to fix it. You know, just as... the I, I know that if you're dealing with kids today, when you look at the way they interact with technology, it blows your mind because they, they just automatically know how to use a video game or a computer or things like that. They know how to program things that older generations are baffled by. When we get into space, it's going to be the same thing. They're going to know how to seal a hole in their habitat. They're going to know how to grow a tomato plant or create food. Um, they're going to know these things the same way we know how to cook on a stove or open a refrigerator or fix a car or operate a, a camera or a computer. It's going to be natural to them. They're going to be humans in space. I mean, the interesting thing is, if you look at the space colonies of O'Neill, it somehow resembles very much, um, let's say, an outskirt of a modern town. When we look at the way that the colonies are presented to us, now again, these are mature colonies. These are several years in. It's not going to be like that at the very beginning. But I think a lot of it is that we are going to recreate what it is that we have here on the earth, hopefully in a, in a better way. Um, but you're going to have trees and, and lakes and birds and flowers and butterflies and families living in those places. That's the goal. Um, it may not, sorry, that's, that's Spread the goal. Spread light. Pardon? Spread life. 
we're going to be spreading life. It's going to be green and bright and light. I don't want it to look like, you know, um, the, the inside of the spaceship and alien, you know, it, it, where it's dark and gloomy and, and all of that. I mean, that creates a great mood for a Hollywood movie, but that's not what we want to do. We want air and bright and light. We want a place where children can grow up and, and be happy and where families can work together to create new communities and new civilization. That's what we're after. It's funny, you celebrate it here in your own home. You're the only one who has plants in front of his house. <laughs> you know, and for me, um, gardening is uh, to release. You know, I have, um, sorry, for me, gardening is a bit of a release. I am very, very caught up in, in what I do. Um, and um, it really is about spreading life into the universe. And there's something, there's something so human about putting your hands in dirt and, and planting something and making it grow. There's something so very, very human to me in that. And so I have plants all around my place. I have fish tanks and aquariums and things like that. Um, a lot of people think of space as being like this cold, high-tech, hard place. Or people that are working in space as being cold engineers and, and machines and things like that. For me, it's not about that at all. It's about life. That's why I have plants and aquariums and things like that. I, I'm just... I'm a big fan of life. And that's what you like to do, gardening in space? I would love to garden in space. You know, I want to plant a tree on Mars. I want to see a butterfly on the moon. I, I want to see um, how we can um, fertilize. Uh, sorry, boom, that was it, yeah. That, that means, so, so that's something you would like, sort of gardening the moon, or gardening in space. I'm about green things. I, I want to see trees on the moon. I want to see butterflies on Mars. I want to see us take the better aspects of gardens and life and forests of different kinds and put them out there uh, into the universe. I, you know, look, for me, even though one might argue that we are the universe learning about itself and being the mechanism by which the universe knows of itself, there is also that interaction where there are forces in the universe that are trying to kill us, that are trying to kill life, not consciously. Life is an invasion on what you might call a domain of death, in a sense, in the universe. So I believe that it is our job to spread life to places that are dead. I believe that it is the ultimate act of a human being to plant a seed and to grow something living. That is a reversal of the way we have treated our own planet. And that, to me, is the shift in what it means to be a human being that is about to occur. Okay, now let's talk about your company, because your company is actually, your company is just, um, well, it's not spreading life. Actually, it's taking well, resources somehow. What's the intention of the, your company, Deep Space Industry? Deep Space Industries is harvesting space resources. We are going out to dead rocks that may or may not actually someday come on, uh, sorry, Deep Space Industries is harvesting space resources. We're going out to dead rocks and extracting from those dead rocks water, the stuff of life. And if we have water, we can then have oxygen to breathe, we have rocket propellant, if we add carbon to the water, we have methane, and we can make plastic, we can build things. We can then take the iron that is available in many of the asteroids and use it to make things. We can then take other metals and use those things, those metals, to build other necessities that we might need in space. And it's Blah. not necessary to bring them to Earth, but actually... Yeah, I, let me be very clear. Yeah. Deep Space Industries is not going out to mine asteroids or harvest... Sorry, Deep, let me be very clear. Yeah. Deep Space Industries is not going out to harvest asteroids to bring those materials back to the Earth. Our goal is to harvest resources for use in space 
so that those going into space don't have to carry them with them as they go. In fact, you're preparing space resources for building space companies. We are going to, Deep Space Industries is going to be harvesting space resources so that we can build an industrial economy in space and eventually human settlements beyond the Earth. Uh, th that's an interesting thing. Uh, but maybe may we should make it more a little bit more clear. Okay. Um, because that actually you're providing the stuff that people are able to settle on. Right. That, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, let me come at that from a different uh, angle then. So so um, what what's the aim of your industry? Yeah, deep space industry's goal is to provide the materials that people will need to live and settle in space. And what do they need? Okay. Some of the things we're going to be able to provide in the early days are going to be water. And if you have water, you have air, you have rocket propellant. Um, and then beyond that, we're going to provide things like iron, which is very easy, we believe. We can extract it from asteroids using magnets, essentially. Um, let me come back at it. We can get... May make it into a complete story because I, I think it's interesting to sort of that you are providing really the resources for space uh, mm -hmm. colonies. Okay. Um, Deep Space Industries is going to be providing the materials in space for people to build civilization in space. In other words, colonies to resupply spaceships that are going between the Earth and the Moon and Mars and places like that. We're not going out there to mine asteroids to bring that stuff back down to the Earth. We pretty well have everything we could bring from an asteroid to the Earth already here on the Earth. After all, the Earth was actually created by asteroids. You know, the Earth is a collection of asteroids that came together in the beginning of the solar system. So it's not like we need to go harvest asteroid materials to bring it down to the Earth. Okay, if you're going into space, you have to climb out of this big gravity well, we call it, to go out there. I'll put it this way. If you went outside right now and you took a handful of dirt and you lifted it into space, it would be worth $10,000, just dirt. It's very, very expensive to take things into space. That's an opportunity for deep space industries because we can go out there mine asteroids, and provide those materials to people that are going into space cheaper than they can carry it from the Earth. And that makes a business. And that's... If we're going to be opening the frontier, we, we have to be able to have business plans that close. In other words, we have to be able to show how we're going to make money. We have to be able to create an economy. Um, and so for deep space industries, being a supply center, being an oasis, being the people that are giving those who are going into space to create colonies what they need to build those colonies is our business. We are in the business of supplying the settlers of the future with what they need to go do what they want to do. What's the time span? I mean, when will this become reality? Yeah. Deep Space Industries is flying our first spacecraft in the... Deep Space Industries is flying our first spacecraft in 2017. Then by 2020, we will be putting our first lander on an asteroid. It's called Prospector 1. Prospector 1 will go to an asteroid in 2020 and land... Uh, sorry, let me start again. Prospector 1 will fly out to an asteroid in 2020 and basically give us an idea of what that asteroid is made of. And then at the end of its life, it's going to actually land on the asteroid so we can learn how the asteroid is made up. Um, people who are um, in the mining business call that diggability. We're going to learn, is it a pile of gravel? Is, is, you know, how much of it is solid? Because we need to know these things if we're going to be harvesting resources, if we're going to be mining it. You have beautiful animations about you know, large ships actually taking a entire asteroid and those kind of things. Is that the future? When we send out, I'm going to run through the genealogy, yeah. the, the whole list. Uh -huh. Okay, so after our first test spacecraft in Earth orbit, we're going to move on out around 2020 and send Prospector 1 
to survey an asteroid or to assay an asteroid and tell us what it's made of and then to land on it so we'll know the composition. Is it a gravel pile? Is it a solid rock? Things like that. Then we'll be able to compare what it tells us to what we're learning by looking at other asteroids. Now, when we come back, I'm sorry, looking at other asteroids. Mm -hmm. Cut. Now, after Prospector 1 has shown us what an asteroid is basically made of relative to what we've seen of them from the Earth, we'll now be able to take that data, that information, and look at other asteroids and decide which ones we want to go prospect. Then we can send out spacecraft that we call harvesters. Harvesters will go out to asteroids and take pieces of them and bring them back and be able to convert those into hydrogen, oxygen. Let me start again on that one. Blah, blah. I'm getting oh, all tripped good, over myself. But... Yeah, I'm getting down in the details yeah. in too detail. Okay, after we send the prospector spacecraft to examine and prospect an asteroid, we will then send out harvesters. They will capture parts of asteroids and bring those back. And from them, we'll be able to extract water. Because, see, we believe most, uh, sorry, we believe there are a large number of asteroids that contain great amounts of water in the form of ice. So if we look into the future, what will be the future of your company, Deep Space Industry? Mm -hmm. Deep Space Industry's um, goal is to be the provider of supplies, materials, and technology for people operating in space, for the companies, for the governments, people who want to settle space, people who want to explore in space. It's going to be always cheaper and easier for them to get what they need from space than to bring it up from the Earth. And we intend to be the people that sell it to them. It's really, uh, look, if you're going to open a frontier, at the end of the day, you have to be able to pay for yourself to be there. To do that, you have to have an economy. To have an economy, you have to have successful businesses. So when I go from this big cosmic picture down to how do I make it happen now, I have to come up with a business plan that allows me to create a profit so that I can have people employed to actually eventually go out there and live. Now, we're going to start with robots with deep space. And I'll come back to that. So... I mean, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's easier to really get it into space, get it, then it's easier to get these resources in space than to get them from the Earth up. It's, sorry, I'm gonna, let me, let me comment this really. Okay. Uh, the, I yeah. liked it, what you said about one, you know, yeah. 100 gram of dust, which actually is... Yeah. Right, right. If you, carry a, if you carry a pound of dirt into space, it's, it's $10,000 to go just as high as the space station. The further you go out, the more expensive it gets. Um, if we can provide air, water, metals, building materials in space to people who are going out there, um, then they don't have to carry it with them. And then we can begin to create a civilization in space. We can begin to settle space. Now, the first product that we're going to deliver in space is going to be water. Why? Because asteroids, sorry, the first product we're going to be, sorry, the first product that we're going to deliver in space is going to be water. Why? Because there are a lot of asteroids that have a high water content in the form of frozen ice. And it's fairly easy to extract. We just heat the asteroid and capture the steam and the other gases that come out. And now we can utilize those to do whatever we want. If you've got water, you've got air. You've got water, you've got propellant in different forms. We can capture those things fairly easily. In fact, you might say that deep space is going to be the building supply center, the gas station, and the oasis for people who are going to carry on other activities in space. Whether Elon Musk is going to Mars or somebody is going to build a village on the moon or somebody is going further out into the solar system, if they don't have to carry what they need to do that with them and they can get it into sp in space, <coughs> oh. 
If Elon Musk is on his way to Mars, or somebody is going to build a village on the moon, or somebody is going to go out and explore the deep solar system, if they can get what they need to go out there from s supplies that are already being provided in space, they can do it a lot more often, a lot more cheaply, and they can do a lot more things. Our goal is to be that gas station, that oasis, that supply depot, so that we can really begin to operate in space and do it in an in a ever-expanding manner. Do you ever expect to be in space yourself? Sorry, hang on. Do I ever expect to be in space myself? Yeah, I'd like to. I really would. But I don't have to. You know, if I can walk out into a field at night and see lights on the moon, um, if I can go to a beach maybe here in Texas and watch a rocket take off that's carrying colonists to Mars, I'll be a happy camper. <laughs>